me um, bring um, Cole and Kirsty on online, and uh, that's Kirsty. Um, both of you will have to unmute yourself. Yeah, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Cole. How are you? Good. Good. Great. Wonderful. So, um, uh, friends. So. Um, uh, we have um, Cole Rosengren from um, Waste Dive. He's a staff reporter at Waste Dive. Um, has been a friend um, for a long time, and uh, you know, been really helpful for uh, Be Waste Wise. And uh, we also have Kirsty Pecky from the Conservation Law Foundation, and um, she's one of the very few attorneys working in waste management. So um, th there'll be a lot, of, a lot that you, you you'll be learning from this conversation uh, between uh, Cole and Kirsty. And um, uh, finally, so um, let me just remind you that uh, this is the last day of the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. We have more programs coming up, uh, you know, for example, a weekly interview series that we're planning. So the announcement will be coming soon. So uh, follow us and subscribe to the monthly newsletter so that you're updated. And um, if you have any questions, use the Q&A box below to submit the questions. And uh, Kisti or Paul, one of them will uh, respond to your um, questions and comments. And um, uh, you can also use the hashtag Waste Dialogue, W-A-S-T-E-D-I-A-L-O-G, Waste Dialogue, to send your questions or comments to us. So uh, with that, I'll let Cole take it from here. Cole, um, it's yours. Great. Thanks, Ranjith. And um, thanks for giving us this opportunity. And thanks for joining us today, Kirsty. Thank you. Always good to talk. Uh, Kirsty and I keep up on Massachusetts waste issues fairly often, so nice to spread that conversation to a wider level. Um, just to start it off, it would be great if you give us a little more on your background. How did you get into waste issues and, uh, you know, why, why is this so interesting to you? Well, you know, looking back, it seems inevitable that I'd worked in waste, but um, but probably I wouldn't have been able to predict it, you know, as a, as a young person. Um, I was interested in environmental law from a very young age. And I had always worked on recycling issues. I worked at our local recycling center. My mother was instrumental in, in, in setting it up. Um, so I was very aware of recycling and cared about that. And then when I went to Harvard, I actually had a job working for the college, setting up the recycling system, getting materials from dorm rooms and labs and offices to the curb. So it was a really neat student job and it was a great opportunity. But I never knew that I'd end up working in you know the legal area around waste issues. Um, then I went to BC Law and after that went and worked at a large firm for about um, six or seven years in Boston and loved that, had a great experience, did a lot of land use law and real estate law as well as environmental law, which in retrospect is the perfect mix for waste because of course waste is about moving things you know across space. Waste is about handling that actual footprint of the waste facility. Um, and then also the environmental issues, the, the hardcore contamination issues. So it makes sense that I got here that way. Um, and then when I, I was home with my kids for a while, I was doing pro bono work and was asked by citizens, local citizens to um, oppose the expansion of the largest landfill in Massachusetts, the Southbridge landfill, um, what was going to become the largest landfill if it was allowed to expand. Uh, so I kind of got in at the last minute on that. Uh, and we learned a lot. I represented 300 citizens all the way to our highest court in Massachusetts. Um, ultimately, we were unable to stop the expansion. However, kept working on it. Worked, uh, you know, as my kids got larger and got, you know got older, and I went back to working full time. Started working with a lot of nonprofits, um, and finally landed at Conservation Law Foundation. Um, and that landfill, they, they tried to expand it again. And now they're not going to be able to, largely in part for the efforts that we've done at Conservation Law Foundation and a lot of other groups, you know, great nonprofit groups across the state. So that's yeah. kind of how I got here. Okay, no, and the, um, the Southbridge case has captured everyone's attention here in Massachusetts mm -hmm. for sure. And it was a big surprise earlier this summer when they announced um, this, in their quarterly earnings call, uh, Casella Waste Systems, a large regional waste company here in New England. Right. That, uh, due in part to a lot of community pressure and there's, many twists and turns in that, but it was a big surprise that they weren't going to kind of continue to fight for that one. And in our conversations, I found interesting, you mentioned this idea of, we assume that these regulations, state, local, federal regulations are being enforced when it comes to landfills. Right. You found that's not necessarily the case due to a variety of factors. Perhaps regulators just aren't 
getting ad adequate budget funding. They, they're not even there in the first place. And so it's fallen to you and some citizens in some cases to kind of check if these things are being complied with, right? That's absolutely correct. Um, and I've been uh, surprised and alarmed by the degree to which a lot of regulations have been ignored. Um, Massachusetts, it, we think of ourselves as being pretty good on the environment, you know, it, being pretty protective. And people assume that the water coming out of their tap is clean. So uh, we think things are running pretty well, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, in 2008, when I was representing the 300 citizens, uh, you know, we pushed back on a lot of the issues around how the landfill was permitted and, and some real serious problems with the permitting. But it never occurred to me that the landfill was already leaking, which it was. Um, so that's something that we were able to use this time because we understood what was happening around the groundwater wells. Um, an even more uh, distressing case is the one in Saugus, Mass, in which we assumed, we knew that it was an unlined landfill, um, but we assumed they had the groundwater monitoring that are required by federal regulations. Um, turns out they don't. So that's, so I, so, you know, to, I don't know if you want me to jump into it right now, but I think that that's kind of the, uh, the big message that I have looking at this, you know, you have to understand first off the nature of landfills, right? There's, uh, landfills that are unlined and now every landfill company is going to tell you that a landfill is lined. Um, I know you've heard this probably from waste companies that it's got a clay liner. You know, they'll say in, in Massachusetts, it's always Boston blue clay, you know, then that's, mm. you know, that's something that you're here uh, because there's a natural clay layer. Many times these landfills are put in um, wetlands or, you know, coastal areas. So yeah, there's clay there naturally and maybe they'll augment it a little bit, but they'll say there's a clay liner. That's pretty much unlined by federal standards now. In 1991, in the United, across the entire United States, uh, the EPA instituted regulations that required a plastic liner, a leachate collection system, and also a gas collection system in all liners, in all landfills, excuse me. Um, and we're talking, as everybody knows, about solid waste, you know, municipal solid waste. So that's commercial waste, that's anything that you're using in your household. What that means is, you know, in the United States, that means probably 85,000 different chemicals are going to be in that landfill. Um, Anything nasty that you can think of, radioactive material, uh, you know, heavy metals, PCBs, the immersion contaminants like PFOAs, uh, you know, PFOAs, uh, all of those contaminants are going to be in your landfill. So the liner systems and groundwater monitoring or system of wells around the landfill to determine whether, um, you know, there's actually been, actually been a leak by testing the groundwater um, for about 200 chemical, chemicals. That's required uh, in, in all landfills in the United States. So when you're working on a landfill, the first step is to find out if there is a liner system, if there is a leachate collection system, and if there's a gas collection system. Mm -hmm. I assumed that all the landfills in Massachusetts had the groundwater monitoring system. And when we asked the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection for those tests in the Saugus landfill, um, they told us they did have them come on in and look at them and we went in and there were no groundwater monitoring tests And we went back a couple of days. They said yeah, come on in come see that, you know Yeah, come see the results it's quarterly monitoring is required. Come on and see um, We went through the files. They weren't there. And so they said well, maybe they're on Bob's desk Maybe they're in Bill's you know, book. Kit. You know, it's a big agency and, um, No, there's not any groundwater monitoring and you know, that was pretty that was pretty shocking to us so, yeah. yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, a quick program, you know, we have a request from Ranjith to move your camera down a little bit, if possible. Oh. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Great. No, and so I think um, it'd be good to maybe, and keeping in mind we have some international viewers too, let's take a step back for a minute, I guess, and mm -hmm. give a sense of how the average landfill is regulated. You know, we think right. of, there are obviously federal regulations in place, but a lot of it often falls to the state and sometimes the local level, even town boards of health in the case of right. Southbridge. What are sort of the, um, what are meant to be the mechanisms for keeping these in check, whether or not they're working? Right, um, so the the federal system in mass in, in the United States sets forth certain guidelines that are that have to be met. As I said, a liner system, now it's, it's RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act in the United States. 
Um, and it's subtitle D of that require, you know, it explains how those municipal solid waste landfill, which includes all of our kind of regular waste, not hazardous waste or sludge or any of those things, but our regular waste, how it's, how it's um, to be dealt with. Uh, you're required to have a dual plastic liner system, groundwater monitoring wells around the landfill, gas collection systems so you're flaring or burning it for energy. Now, those systems don't work. Regard, you know, there's, there's some fantastic work by um, doctors Jones Lee and Dr. Lee in California, Fred G. Fred Lee, they're fantastic. And they've outlined how those plastic liner systems also fail and how those collection systems, air and water, fail. Um, so that's a whole nother topic that we can get into. But the first thing you want to check is if, you know, what systems are in place and if those systems match your federal, state, and local regulations. In the United States, the states take on that regulatory duty and interpret the federal regulations as they wish. They can mimic them entirely, they can make them a little bit stricter, um, and, and so then that's their responsibility. In the case, for instance, of Saugus, the state made a deal with Wheelabrator Saugus, the company that runs the incinerator and ash landfill that I'm talking about, and said, well, this has been here for a long time. It's been here since the 1950s. Uh, it doesn't have liners, it doesn't have groundwater monitoring, we're going to let you run it until it's full as per your engineering plans. And then they just keep letting them change the engineering plans. So they did a kind of a runaround, a sidestepping of, of the regulations. Wherever you are, whether it's in the United States or another country, the first step is to check physically what's on the ground and then also check your federal government regulations to see are you know are you in compliance? Because again, I would have assumed we were here in Massachusetts, and we were not. And then the next thing to do once there are once you find those those groundwater monitoring reports, which you know God help you, hopefully you have them. Um, if you have those reports, if you have some system of testing what leachate that garbage coffee has been released into the groundwater into the soil around the landfill, check them to see what's being released. Um, all landfills, whether they are unlined with some kind of clay or soil liner or have a double plastic liner, as I said, according to Drs. Lee, um, they, they are going to leak. Uh, and that's, that's just understood. Mm -hmm. The best landfill, you know, constructed most perfectly will leak within about 20, 25 years at best case scenario. And considering that, you know, in the United States, there are about 8,000 fires at landfills every year, and about 2,000 landfills are 8,000 fires. Considering that there are lightning strikes, considering that there's a lot of corrosive material in the garbage, a lot of times I think that that is actually much, much, it's much earlier than 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So first step, check what your regs are at the federal level and check if you know what's actually on the ground because you might be, you might be surprised as what you find and, and you might be able to take action to actually require them to put protections in place. Yeah, I know, and we've certainly seen that um, both in Massachusetts and states around the country. And I guess I'd be curious to see sort of how you see the role of groups like CLF, Conservation Law Foundation, at a time when, as we've talked about before, budgets for state regulators are down, local towns may just not have the expertise or the bandwidth. A lot of times, members of town boards of health or local legislators are part-time jobs. You know, have you seen a need for more action by groups like yours to get involved? Um, um, Kirsten, I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, can you please unmute yourself? Um, I muted you because there was some audio feedback. I'm sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, let me repeat your, call, your question, Cole, to make sure that everyone heard it. So uh, absolutely, there's more need for work by groups like Conservation Law Foundation, um, by other grassroots groups who are working with citizens to figure some of this out, and also a lot of technical expertise. And, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, if I had a staff of, you know, six people right now, I could keep them busy all day working on the landfills through, there's about a hundred landfills operating through New England. I could, and, you know, ash and municipal solid waste. Um, as you know, the ash or landfills are required to run a, an incinerator uh, because there are just so many uh, problems and this area is so underserved. So as you said, there are federal regulations 
In the United States, we can bring citizen suits to enforce those regulations. So not only are there violations of RICRA, I bet at most of the landfills through New England, you know, the ones I've looked at, there are, uh, because RICRA, that federal regulation, requires that you're not allowed to release contaminants into the environment. We also have the Clean Water Act, um, which you're not allowed to release environment uh, contaminants into our navigable waters. So if it's going into a river or a stream or a wetlands, it's going to end up in the river. It's it's illegal. So that's not being enforced at the federal level. level and the state governments are woefully underfunded. And I would bet that's the, the case around the world, unfortunately. You know, environmental protection is just not made a priority as it should be. Um, so what we found is that not only did we find that the state government was not necessarily being as proactive as they could be in updating the landfill, like the Saugus landfill, but on top of that, those groundwater monitoring reports for different landfills, the company or municipality submits them to the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, and they sit on a shelf. There's nobody at the agency whose job it is to say, wow, this landfill is leaking. We need to shut it down or we need to start remediating it or doing things differently. Um, so I think that that is probably the case throughout the country. Uh, I would love to hear, but it's not. But I think, unfortunately, it probably is. Never mind the operating landfills. We have a lot of closed landfills across the country, too, and I'm sure across the world that are also leaking. So that's a problem. And then our state, our, our municipal government in Massachusetts is incredibly powerful because we don't have very powerful counties and we don't have powerful regional government. So our municipal government can actually be a huge force for change, which is another reason why grassroots groups can be incredibly important and powerful. And we found that in the Southbridge case that the Board of Health in Charlton was very instrumental. It's the next town over from Southbridge. They were very instrumental in making this happen. And also the town government of Southbridge was very instrumental in really looking at what was happening now um, around that landfill. So they can be very powerful. Unfortunately, as you said, Cole, they're not just part-time, they're, they're volunteers, right? So you've got a teacher, and a dentist and you know a couple other folks who are really nice people volunteering for their community they don't know much about landfills though um or incinerators so it's, it can be a lot on them and it's a lot to expect them to be as courageous as we need them to be to protect our environment yeah and i can imagine one well, sounds like that's where you know groups like yours have stepped in um i'd like to get some thoughts for kind of how this could be applied internationally but first i'd be curious um what else what's coming up in the future for either your zero waste project or clf i know obviously the um the will brader lawsuit continues uh what else is on your agenda for the fall well so i'm excited about a couple different things one thing is that um as i think most of the viewers probably know you can't just shake your fist at landfills and incinerators um, as dangerous and polluting as they are we have to have a better alternative in place and we know that zero waste programs that reduce, reuse, recycle, and you know, really change how we handle our waste so that we've got a sustainable circular economy um, really work and save us a lot of money at the municipal and, and personal level and also create a lot of jobs. So that's really important to institute those programs. Uh, and the city of Boston is actually beginning a planning process this fall, a zero waste planning process. So they've hired an incredible team of, um, of experts to help them out with that. They're going to have a series of public meetings. I'm really excited to be a part of that. I think that's going to be transformative. Um, I'm also very excited about the waste work, the, the food waste work that's happening in Massachusetts. Uh, the Mass DEP, as tough as I am on them, the people who are there work really hard and care very much about these issues. They just don't have enough uh, manpower and enough money. I mean, they've just lost people over and over again. So our Mass Department of Environmental Protection has instituted a large-scale food waste ban for anybody who produces more than a ton of waste a week, uh, food waste a week. They are required to divert it from landfills and incinerators. They have to compost it or process it in an aerobic digester or, or find some other way of, of reusing it. So that um, it seems to be working which is really exciting. The Mass DEP seems to have done a really good job on that. They're gonna release a report on that very soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we can take that success 
and um, encourage the mass DP to uh, adopt this at a you know at a higher level, so that if you're creating a half a ton of food waste as a business, and then and keep ramping it up, so soon all food waste is out of our landfills and incinerators, because I think that would really be transformative and something that we should be doing definitely throughout New England. Um, and then finally, I I continue to try and determine exactly which are the most dangerous. Um, municipal solid waste and ash landfills throughout New England. So we're trying to look at, okay, Saugus being unlined and without groundwater monitoring. Again, you might be told wherever you are, you know, uh, the government doesn't want you to, you know, rock the boat. Their jobs are hard enough. So many times you'll be told, oh, there's monitoring, but it won't necessarily be the kind of monitoring that you want it to be or really work. So make sure you keep checking whether the systems are in place to protect the public health. And that's something that I wanna keep doing throughout New England and figuring out, are there other spots where people are really in danger the way they are in Saugus, Massachusetts and the towns around them, Revere and, and, um, and Lynn? Yeah, no, I think that's very important. And it's a tough balance, right? So many, particularly in the Boston metro area, these disposal options right now, it's either that or it sends stuff a lot farther away, right? And so finding that balance yeah. of, and I know the goal of long term zero waste. Right, exactly, exactly. You don't want to export it. You don't want to be using these poorly regulated facilities. The goal of zero waste is eventually to not need disposal options at all. Right, right. right. Meantime, how do you yeah. balance that? Well, you know, we have regulations in Massachusetts in place if we enforce them. Those waste ban, we have waste ban regulations mm -hmm. that, that state that you're not allowed to put uh, not only the food waste I talked about earlier, but also cardboard, paper, bottles, cans, a lot of other materials are not allowed to go into in landfills and incinerators, but the Mass DEP estimates that 40% of what is going into landfills and incinerators are those materials. Wow. So that's a real area of focus for me to enforce, again, start off by enforcing the regulations you have. Wherever you are, I bet they're not being enforced enough. And if that's the case, whether it's on the zero waste end of it or on the facility end of it, you can make a tremendous dif difference and raise awareness of how dangerous these facilities in the system you know, are right now by doing that. So that's mm -hmm. that's a really good place to start. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great um, first piece of advice and kind of transition into how folks could use this in other countries, perhaps. And it's tricky because I know regulations are obviously so different everywhere. Right. And of course, you're mainly focused in New England. But any kind of general thoughts for someone who wants to, you know, to get involved or pay a little more attention to what's happening near them? Yeah, I, I would say first off, water, water, water. Um, people care deeply about the cleanliness of their water. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a mixed bag of sewer systems and, and water from reservoirs and, um, and aquifers, you know, so water systems through, throughout cities and personal wells. Um, you want to make sure that those, that those systems aren't being impacted by waste facilities. Uh, and many times they are, and, and, you know, and people don't realize it. Uh, especially personal wells will sometimes be impacted. It's a lot easier to prove whether there's contamination in the water than there is to prove whether it's, there's contamination in the air. Hmm. So I, I care deeply about the air pollution impacts of incinerators and landfills, um, but it's more difficult for me to change those regulations because those are usually at a federal level and very entrenched. Um, than it is to, and it's also very difficult to prove exactly what's happening in the air because it's air, uh, you know, and, and, and air experts will go around and around and torture you, you know. Water, <laughs> water is a little more straightforward. Hmm. So, so I find that it's, it's a better investment of your time to read, you know, you're, you're gonna wanna fix everything. If you have a facility you're concerned about, whether it's an incinerator or a landfill, look at the water impacts look at the water impact of the leachate that's leaking from the ash landfill or, or municipal solid waste landfill. Um, look at the leachate that's pumped from those facilities and where it goes. If there are, are coolants being used, for instance, the Wheel of Raider Saugus incinerator, which is one of the oldest ones in the country, that incinerator takes the leachate from the ash landfill and cools the uh, ash with it. And then the other leachate is brought to a waste sewer, you know, wastewater sewer treatment plant. Sewer treatment plants can't handle leachate. So that's another place for you to, to work and say, wait a second, what's in this leachate? And then what's coming out the pipe into the river? So 
those are areas where I think that there's, you know, real potential for action. And then, so, so I would say water rather than air if possible. Mm -hmm. Another piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, I think about things as a lawyer. So I look at the law and I want to enforce the law, but I need good facts. And generating those facts can be incredibly resource intensive. So wherever you are, whatever system you're working with, try and find the facts that already exist that from the waste company. Um, there are usually some kinds of tests that are required, and there is usually um, reporting of failures of the system. Um, focus on those. You know, if you're going to do a, a legal challenge or a grassroots campaign, focus on what you know, but the waste company themselves have said. Um, so you don't have to spend time debating what's true and what's not. There's a lot of dangerous stuff that's happening that the waste companies are reporting, just nobody's paying attention. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. One to go back to the Southbridge example, we how we learned about the landfill closure was from their quarterly earnings report, which is yeah, you know not exactly. a widely read document by the average person. You know, um, right. so there's a lot of stuff out there that you just got to know where to look for it. I guess that makes that's, sense. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah, and it's really important that we have journalists like you working on this so that we can um, tap into the good work you've done and always you know sure. I I read waste dive. I try and look at you know as much of the stuff that's that's happening. EcoCycle is another um, mm -hmm. organization that puts a lot of good information out there. Um, Gaia, of course, Zero Waste Europe. There are a lot of great folks who are writing fantastic stuff. So if you're working on something, if you have a fire at the facility you're at, or if you know it's a certain type of um, incinerator or um, or a landfill, look look it up. But you know, it, it, you'll be amazed at what you'll find sometimes. Um, Earth Justice has also done a lot of fantastic work around incineration. So a lot of the background is already there for you, and you can find out a lot that way. So it's really worth doing. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think it's uh, for as widespread as waste management is in our lives, it doesn't get a lot of attention in the media necessarily. But it is if you know where to look, you know, and um, and even a lot of us working on it don't necessarily connect with each other as often as we should. So, right, you know, right. like you said, it's probably someone who could be an expert on this particular topic and you just need to find them a lot of times. You know, and everybody's so nice about helping out, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mentioned Dr. Lee earlier. I'm a huge admirer of his work. Um, there's a gentleman named Peter Anderson out of Wisconsin who's done familiar, fantastic work uh, around air issues. He's great. Uh, at, at Earth Justice, they're really nice people at Earth Justice and they have incredible expertise and they will help you out. Gaia, everybody at Gaia is really nice, G-A-I-A. -A. Uh, you know, these people want to help you to, um, to protect your public health and your, in your community and they understand what you're going through because they've been in the trenches themselves. So reach out to people and, and you know, it's a really nice community. They'll be happy to help you. Yeah, no, I've uh, certainly found that to be the case myself. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left and we're um, a reminder to viewers, we're happy to take any questions as they come in. Um, please feel free. Until we get some, something that's come to mind, and I know you don't work on this as much, but maybe you could give just kind of a basic sense. We always talk about regulating disposal facilities, you know, landfills, incinerators. What should we be watching out for with, say, uh, recycling facilities, material recovery facilities, composting, AD? What mm -hmm. are potential issues there to be watching for? Well, you know, um, these facilities are not going to be successful unless they minimize nuisances and unless they're really well run. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those facilities to do a great job. And many folks are doing a great job running these facilities across the board. Um, but that being said, they have to be properly cited. If you if you try and if you tried to put a farm in a, in a densely populated suburban neighborhood, everyone's going to be unhappy, right? And there's and, and a farm is not a dangerous use, but it's just going to get on your neighbor's nerves. Uh, so the same is true for composting, recycling facilities, and AD facilities. There's a certain amount of truck traffic. There's no matter what type of facility run like that, there's going to be a certain amount of noise and odor. Um, they're minimized if it's run well, but they, should, they have to be properly cited. You can't just plonk them in the middle of Times Square. So, right. yeah. So I think that's important. I also think that uh, the successful systems that I've seen have rigorous and constant education, and they have kind of a carrot and stick attitude about making sure that their users 
are not um, as what I call aspirational recyclers who are putting stuff in the bin that's not recyclable. Um, my husband accuses me of being an aspirational recycler all the time. Said you should know better. I said no, I think it's really no, it's not recyclable. <laughs> so you, you have to if it just because it has the triangle on it doesn't mean it's recyclable, or it doesn't mean it's recyclable in your system. So you have to try as a user to be good about that, but then more importantly, the system has to have a mechanism in place for continued education, for some kind of ticketing or fine if you're screwing it up over and over again, and for some kind of inspection to make sure it's happening. So I think that's that's got to happen for all of these systems if they're going to be successful. And we have to keep also being, I think we have to be very, very honest about what works and what doesn't. If something's not recyclable, we should be publicizing that it's not recyclable and finding some way of saying, all right, either this is a material we have to ban. I mean, I think that I think uh, polystyrene is a perfect example. It, it, it just it's nasty. So, you know, we have to we have to kind of suck it up and be honest about when something's not really working and when it's costing the municipality or local government or citizens more money than it should be. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good point. Uh, the talk of contamination in recycling is a big, big conversation right now in the industry, working on how to educate people, how to work with people on that. Yeah. And um, it's interesting you mentioned the polystyrene. We have a viewer question, actually, about extended producer responsibility. I know it's an area you don't work as much in, but we've seen a lot of talk about this lately. Um, California, Connecticut, what are you hearing in a legal sense in the waste world about this? Well, you know, uh, in a legal sense, so I, I feel like my expertise is looking at the uh, re regulations and laws and then you know trying to look at the systems as a whole I'm not always the best person on the ground for you know looking at markets and things like that and there are a lot of people who have a lot more expertise in that than me I, I will say though that there are certain types of EPR legislation that seem to work and so I think it depends on I think it depends on your waste stream and what you're dealing with and I think uh, I don't know. I, I it, it, you know, I've heard different experts will wrangle about whether EPR is the best thing ever or going to crush an industry that's that's been burgeoning. Um, I think you have to look at your situation and say, all right, th as I as I just said about polystyrene, this is not a product that I want to see in anything I use. Hmm. So one way to influence that is to institute pay as you throw programs because I am amazed if you find the right price point for your bag or bin, people will stop buying certain materials if they realize they have to throw it out and then pay more for their bag or bin. So that's one way of getting at the problem that I think works really well. And then also, you know, publicizing, yeah, this, you no, know, you know, it has a triangle on it, but it's not recycling. That education, you know, can also minimize people's use. But at the end of the day, you've got to figure out do you want to put an EPR system in place, or do you want to outright ban something? Hmm. Um, personal bag, you know, uh, plastic single-use grocery bags. I think that they should be outright banned. I I don't think there's a need for them. There's other materials that work better. We can, you know, re there are reusable bags people can use. Not that hard. Let's do that. Other things not as easy to replace, right? So we want to send them back to the brilliant engineers at these different companies. And, and in Massachusetts, we're really lucky because we have a lot of schools that want to look into these problems, too, mm -hmm. and try and figure out, all right, how do you make kitty litter that actually uh, doesn't have to go into a landfill? You know, we've got people trying to figure that stuff out. So sometimes in that situation, EPR is going to work. Okay. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the bag example. Um, Massachusetts has a lot of kind of grassroots activism around that right now. I forget the exact count. See the 50 to 60 uh, local municipalities. Yeah, I, I want to say 53, 54. Okay, um, that's which, right. Yeah, which is, you're right, and uh, and that's up from, I think, 20, 23 over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So um, we have 351 municipalities in Massachusetts. Uh, Mass Green, a guy named um, Brad Verter, has been acting to give local municipalities kind of a toolbox for how to pass a bag ban in their community because many times they will get pushed back. Oh, well, we'll just allow this kind of bag or... Uh, it's not going to work in this store, but it'll work in that store. And when it's happened and worked in other municipalities, they can take those lessons and transfer them and, and um, help people figure it out in their community. Every community is different. There's going to be you know different challenges in every community, but they've done a really great job of, um, of doing that. And they're also doing polystyrene bags, bands. I believe mm -hmm. they have in the early 20s, something like, you know, yeah. like 25, I think. 
Yeah, no, I think that sounds right. Um, no, and I'm glad we got a chance to talk about Mass Green Network, actually, because I think they're, they tie into this well. They're a good example of how citizens can get involved and share resources with each other. And yeah, the people, there's a great kind of email listserv going around when folks in one town are trying to do it. They'll email people from another town to hear how they did it successfully, you know, know the same talking points. And it's, this is more, maybe not necessarily your area, but interesting in a legal sense that they're trying to do this to force action on a state level. Because right now to get anything past the state level is challenging. There's more lobbying efforts, it just takes longer. And so their goal is to have so many different local regulations that there will be kind of an outcry for a standard state approach. This is what Brad's told me before. Um, it's interesting to see that because to get stuff past any kind of waste legislation is hard at the state level, but locally it's possible right now, it seems like. I think I think you're absolutely right, Cole. I, you know, Massachusetts has was it seven million people. Mm -hmm. um, getting anything passed at a, a government of that size is very difficult. Uh, not that it's not a tremendous amount of work to get the municipalities to do it, and you know, 50s is not 351, so there's a lot more work to be done. But yeah, I think it also shows uh, you know a groundswell, you know, but, you know but, that there's a, it's a pivotal moment to change these things in the, in the state. So I think people are excited about it for that reason too. Yeah. No, agreed. Um, and another just side note on that, an interesting development is we're seeing a lot of uh, preemptive state laws happening right now. And that's sort of a, something else for people to be aware of. There's basically a, a ban on bans, I call them. You know, they put the right so yeah. that no local action can happen at all. It hasn't happened in mass yet, but other states have passed it or trying to pass it. So okay. something for folks to watch out for. Well, unfortunately, when you pick one, and, and this is maybe another piece of advice for folks, when you pick one product, when you pick, you know, um, bags, for instance, uh, then the industry unifies against you. Um, and it, we found that with the bottle bill in Massachusetts, the uh, the industry spent twelve million dollars, uh, you know, against expanding the bottle bill in Massachusetts. So when you pick one waste stream, it sometimes means that you're going to get a unified response from the industry that might crush you. So sometimes it's better to look at the broader principles. Um, and, and also try and attack the, the, the heavier problematic issues. I think that um, food waste, it, it, we've seen so much movement. London, uh, New Jersey, New Jersey, you know, like, you know, if food waste has become a hot topic because people care about feeding people too, which is so awesome. So we've got momentum in that direction. And then on top of that, people understand the climate change impacts of methane. So in that, and food waste is what causes methane in the landfill. So people are getting excited about that too. So it's important to focus on the right fight that's gonna take a lot of waste out of the system or the most dangerous waste out of the system and hopefully not have those, you know, really unified opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a good ending note, this idea of how to make it personal for folks. So often waste feels like there's something that goes away that, you know, you put it at the curb and you don't have to think about it. And so whether it's pointing out health effects from the disposal site near your house or the benefits that you could have from, you know, saving your food scraps or doing, you know, just all these kind of things, making it on personal terms. It can make it, it can easily feel kind of beyond you and all this legal stuff can get the average person thinking, well, it's not my problem, well, but it, it's all of our problem. Yeah, no, RICRA, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act and Clean Water Act, they're enforceable by citizen suits here in the United States. So, and I, and I think you're right. You know, you've got to make it personal. Um, you've got to make it personal, but not get overwhelmed. It's okay if you, you know, it's okay if you work hard and make progress. Uh, you know, I got beat down, uh, you know, in the first the first time that the, that um, Casella was expanding the Southbridge landfill. But this time, they're they're closing it. They're closing it next year. So don't feel like what you're doing isn't impactful, isn't important, even if it's not immediately successful. You're changing the conversation, you're meeting great people and doing great work, and it's a lot of fun. It's really worthwhile. Yeah, no, it really is. It's been um, fun getting to know folks in my time doing this too. It's uh, There's a, a wide world of people, like you said, to talk to, and everyone seems happy to share it because this just doesn't get a lot of attention in your local paper, and that's a whole other media conversation we could get into. You know, as papers are, <laughs> losing their own staffs, just like state agencies, there's yeah. fewer people that are informed to talk about this. Um, yeah. But because so many waste issues are local, these contracts are often local, things are happening on a local level. It's important for people to pay attention. Uh, yeah. It can be hard to find those outlets, but there's groups out there often, you know, at least at, 
if not at a local level, at a state level, there's usually somebody in your community talking about this, it sounds like. Absolutely. And people are interested in it too. So Yeah. And um, we're almost out of time, but just on a final note, um, be good to mention that CLF does national work as well, right? And I know you don't do that as much. No, but, through New England. Through New England. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we Did also... Did onto the NSPS lawsuit or am I... Well, we, no, we do. I, I guess, I, I, let me take that back. So we're a regional organization. Um, we're one of the first uh, environmental law nonprofits that was ever established in, in the United States. 1966, I think, was when we were established. So um, we, and we work on a lot of different areas, oceans, rivers, air, energy. I mean, you know, uh, my program, the Zero Waste Program, is part of the Healthy Communities Environmental Justice Program because we didn't get there, but, you know, this is something that hits us all personally, most especially because our most vulnerable populations, our environmental justice populations in whichever country we're in, are the ones who live next door to a waste facility. Um, Southbridge is an environmental justice population. Saugus is an environmental justice population. The communities around it are. That's always how the story goes. And that's one of the drivers for this work. So. So CLF does a, a wide range of different types of uh, lobbying, litigation, and other types of advocacy, and just providing expertise for people who are doing good work themselves. Right, right. No, that's good. And I think uh, providing expertise on stuff, you know, other other communities are, it, it was the NRDC lawsuit they teamed up with, if I'm not mistaken, but, right? Over that, around... and another uh, another uh, suit that you'll be familiar with is the, um, uh, for instance, the Green Line extension and the Green Line you know, in Massachusetts when we had when we were in, in expanding our driving infrastructure, Conservation Law Foundation made sure that there was public transportation always included in that. And we do a lot of work around transportation still. Uh, and then also energy, the the um, Lewis case that we've done a lot of work on throughout New England on that, those issues too, making sure that our climate change impacts are as, you know, as um, Got a lot of work to do there, but we're working on, working on climate change impacts as much as possible. So, yeah, no, and waste is certainly part of that. It does not yeah. get mentioned as much of that in that conversation, but it definitely is. So, no, you know, actually, I'm I'm um, beginning a report. We're, well, I've got a new intern coming, beginning a report on the climate change impacts of waste in Massachusetts and mishandling our waste because we have to change how we do production. That's a whole nother whole nother conversation for another day. But transportation, energy, and production of goods are what are driving climate change. And without that third leg of the stool, we're not going to solve this problem. Yeah, well, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, and if folks want to follow your work, what's a good way for them to keep up with what you're doing? A um, couple different ways. I do have, I'm on Twitter at Kirsty Petchy. Um, I'm, you can always email me, kpetchy at clf.org. Um, I'm on the website, so definitely Conservation Law Foundation, definitely look me up and reach out. And um, also, you know, give me a call. I'm very happy to help people out on these issues. So it, it's really important to me that people um, not tilt at windmills, that they really use their time productively and get as much done as they can locally and also driving a regional and federal governments. Excellent. No, and I can attest to that. Uh, you've been helpful to me. In, uh, in well, that's very nice of you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say Cole seems like a very fair journalist and everything I've seen, though, you know, doesn't always say exactly what I wanted to say, but <laughs> I guess that's kind of his job. So. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> thanks to uh, Be Waste Watch for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Ranjit. Thank you so much. And likewise, if folks want to follow along, uh, what I'm doing to get in touch with me, my Twitter is at Cole Rosengren, and you can find me just about daily on the trade publication Waste Stuff. So thanks again. Um, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Cole, and thanks, Kirsty. Uh, that was a you know, great conversation. Uh, um, uh, I've worked a lot internationally, um, and um, I have experience there. But um, to hear this from you know an attorney working here, I think that's amazing. Uh, it was a great learning um, to do. And um, I also believe um, U.S. Um, uh, is at the you know forefront of EPR and pay as you throw. Um, mechanisms. So uh, it was amazing uh, learning about that from you too. So thank you very much, uh, guys. Thanks. Thank you.